Hallelujah. Uh, like Brother Mark, I'm so happy to be back with the family. Uh, a brother last night said to me, uh, we met for the first time last night, he goes, welcome home. And I was like, it's good to be home. Good to be with the family, the family of God. Hallelujah. And uh, I also spoke with Brother Dick Taylor last night for a few minutes, so he sends his love and greetings also to the saints. Amen. So we are um, in this marvelous, marvelous conference, the experience and enjoyment of Christ in Philippians and Colossians for the bringing forth of the one new man. And I think our first message was that not a lovely message on the experience of Christ in Philippians. And then in this message, we're going to continue with the experience of Christ in Colossians. And then the uh, following two messages, one after lunch, then tomorrow morning, are uh, they're on the uh, one new man. And maybe we could say at least a few practical handles on how we can... Uh, live in the reality of the one new man, and one of those is taking Christ as our person. So surely we need to experience and enjoy him, to take him as our person. And then the prayer needed. None of these messages, none of what we're enjoying this weekend will become real to us without thorough and adequate prayer. Personal prayer, twos and threes prayer, Uh, home meeting prayer, and the prayer of the church. That the one new man would be brought forth, not only on the whole earth, but here where we are in southern Africa. May the Lord get the reality of the one new man in this part of the earth where we are enjoying the church life. And then the final message of the conference marries these. They're not actually two separate lines, because the experience and enjoyment of Christ issues in the one new man. But we must have the uh, genuine experience, the real enjoyment. It can't be just more knowledge to us, doctrine to us. Oh yes, I know. Yes, I know all about the Christ in Ephesians, the Christ in Philippians, the Christ in Colossians. Well, it's good that we know, but we want to experience Enjoy and live out this Christ for the one new man. And that will be our final message for the conference. Um, And then also maybe just to mention, you know, this is really the up-to-date burden in the ministry. Uh, These two major burdens, you could say, on one, the experience of Christ. That was actually the title of the Memorial Day conference in May of 2019. It was simply called The Experience of Christ. And then we had in uh, Thanksgiving in November, experiencing or knowing and experiencing the all-inclusive, extensive Christ. But what for? For the one new man. And then the Itero in India in uh, October was on the, uh, the one new man, the, the, uh, the um, creation of the one new man, the one new man fulfilling God's purpose in creating him. So these are two major burdens in the ministry at the moment, and we are so happy that we could be together to enjoy uh, a kind of a, a compilation of some of the riches of these different conferences together in in this conference here in South Africa. Um, Then um, I'm I'm kind of just following Brother Ron, who shared this message at the Thanksgiving conference, and one of the, the, his opening word was a, a little question, not an interrogation, but his word or his question was, who is Christ to you? If a new one, and we have, I hope, and I believe there are many new believers with us in this conference. Maybe this is your first conference. Well, if one of the new saints asked us, who is Christ to you? How would we respond? And the brother asked that question, and I've been asking that question. Lord, who are you in my experience? I know a lot about you. But how much do I experience you? 
How much do I enjoy you? How much do I live you in my practical, actual Christian life, in my family life, in my serving life? How much is Christ expressed? Yes, I'm a Christian, but do I live Christ? You'll hear this from me periodically. The trainees, I'll be here for the next two weeks, will hear me talking about my driving. My driving. Who drives? Me or Christ? You know, Brother, Brother Mark mentioned Augustine's word, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. That's a really, really practical piece of advice. But how about my driving? Does my driving, would that be, could that be regarded as a preaching of the gospel? Or is that an expression of Satan? I'm speaking about myself. I'm certain everybody in this room is a really, really good driver, a very careful driver. I may be the only exception, but that's my experience. Do I drive? Does Christ drive in my driving? Does Christ speak in, when, as Brother Mark mentioned, in our conversations at home with our spouse, with our children? Is it Christ or is it me? This is where the Lord wants to bring us to the same experience as our dear brother Paul. And this is the encouragement. I mean, I, I appreciate, I, I really appreciate the pattern of the Lord as the first God-man living not by his own life or by his natural life, but by living the Father's life. So the words that he spoke, the works that he did, they were the Father's words, the Father's works, and the Father's will. And then Paul was a reproduction of the first God-man. And we, we've seen and we will see more how much Paul entered into this reality. That is why he could rewrite the books of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, because this was his genuine experience. When Paul said, for to me to live is Christ... That is, that was his experience. For to, for to me to live is just Christ. Amen. And the Lord's desire for all of us is that could be our testimony, our reality. And when that reality is lived out on the earth, that reality is the one new man. That reality is the reality of the body of Christ. And that living, that reality, will bring the Lord back. And I don't know about you, uh, but I, I pray every day, come Lord Jesus. Already the world, I, how can it get any worse? How can it get any more degraded? And yet, it seems year by year, it does get worse and more degraded. And you're wondering, Lord, when, how long more will you delay? And he says, well, what I am waiting for is my body to be manifested, to be built up, my bride to be prepared. I'm waiting for the one new man to appear on the earth. When that is done, I will come. So, it depends on us, dear saints. It depends on the Christians who have seen this revelation, who have prayed over this revelation, and are endeavoring little by little, day by day, in their just very ordinary lives to bring forth this reality in their family life, in their married life, in their work life, in their driving, in their shopping, in their dressing, in every way. May it be our testimony for me, for to me to drive is Christ. For me to dress is Christ. For me to speak to my wife is Christ. Hallelujah. Um, so, uh, there's a verse that I uh, enjoy very much in Acts 22. You know, Paul... Um, describes his salvation experience three times in the book of Acts, in chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26. And in 22, 
uh, when he is praying and fasting and blind in Damascus, this dear brother appears, brother Ananias, who tells Paul, as a direct word from the Lord, uh, the God of our fathers has previously appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the voice from his mouth. This was Paul's destiny to know God's will. Our message, this second message, is the will of God concerning the all-inclusive, extensive Christ. I am so thankful that we can know what God's will is because there was a brother, a hair-on-fire brother, who received revelation after revelation directly from the Lord Jesus to see His face and hear His voice. And we have, you know, the initial revelation, you could say, in the books of Colossians, or, um, Romans, um, Galatians, some of Paul's early epistles, First and Second Thessalonians, the early epistles. And we see a progressive revelation of Christ. But it is only, and this seems so almost like a paradox, it is only after Paul was imprisoned that he was able to receive the revelation of the books of Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And then Philemon, which is a continuation of the book of Colossians. These four books contain the highest revelation of the church, and in the book of Colossians, that's Ephesians, and the highest revelation of Christ. The Christ in Colossians is the vast universal, unlimited Christ. The Christ in Colossians is the, un, uh, the all-inclusive, extensive Christ. But it, it required, you know, again, like Brother Mark was sharing there, you know, our concept was, oh, we should, we should do so many things, so many things. But the Lord actually stopped Paul. Stopped Paul's outward work so that he could work on Paul in a Roman prison and unveil to him. So the revelation we are receiving concerning the unlimited Christ came from a brother who was experiencing extreme limitation, chained to a Roman guard. That is where he said, basically, Christ is unlimited as he was completely limited. And so, to anybody in this room who's experiencing limitation, there was one, the person who was the most limited person ever was the Lord Jesus Christ. God himself, the infinite God, became a, we say, finite man, a limited man, limited by time, limited by space, Yet the unlimited God was living in him. And this unlimited God was living in Paul when Paul was imprisoned in uh, a Roman prison, and yet he could share revelation after revelation concerning this one, and even prayed not to get out, not to be set free from his limitation, but that he would experience the bountiful supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, so that in everything and all things, uh, he would not be put to shame, but Christ would be magnified, made great in his body. And then he says, for to me to live is Christ. So I appreciate our brother's fellowship about, you know, we may feel like, oh, I don't have a church life. But our church life, the genuine church life, is the issue of our experience of Christ. So if you can experience changing your newborn's nappies, you have the church life. If you can 
receive your husband who's just come back from an enjoyable meeting, but you're stuck at home with a smile and how are you and praise the Lord, you have the church life. That's quite a revelation. The experiences of Christ are the genuine church life. Amen. So this, our dear brother, he experienced the all-inclusive extents of Christ. And then just before we get into the outline, this, this particular word, extensive. What do we mean by the word extensive? The title of the message, the will of God concerning the all-inclusive extents of Christ. Well, I think in message one, we surely had some... Uh, Help in understanding. What does extensive it mean? It means beyond measurement, immeasurable, vast, unlimited, unlimited, exhaustless, more vast than the universe. That is the extent of Christ. The Christ that we have living within us is more vast than the universe. There was an outline a a number of years ago where uh, Brother Lee shared that we need to be not just individual Christians, not just uh, corporate Christians, not just local Christians, or national Christians, and not even international Christians. We need to be universal Christians. And I thought, well, what in the world does that mean, to be a universal Christian? Well, that means someone who experiences the universal Christ, the unlimited Christ. Our Christ, the dimensions of the universe are just a picture, just a type of how immeasurable, how unlimited, how vast the Christ we have is. But how much do we experience Him? Uh, And going to the... I'm just referring back to the first outline. It talks about the proper love lived out by a Christian is unlimited or extensive. I love who I love, but I don't love this brother. I don't love that sister. I don't like that saint who talked to me that way. Yet the love, our love should be unlimited. The other example, forgiveness. How many times should I forgive that elder who has offended me? Seven times, Lord? And we know the answer, well, it's not even seven times 70. It means unlimited forgiveness. I am not married. I'm married half as long as Brother Mark, 20 years. I probably have surpassed the 490 mark a long time ago as well. But the real sweetness in marriage, I believe, is when we learn to forgive one another. Again, and again, and again. That is, that is the genuine experience. You know, we may have this thought, oh, I need to come to the conference to experience Christ. Well, of course, there's a very particular portion in the conferences, but we can experience this unlimited one in all kinds of normal Christian situations. So we have love, uh, endurance. It's, I'm just going back at this outline again. Paul's experience of Christ as his unlimited endurance was for the magnification of the unlimited Christ. So he was able to endure his Roman imprisonment. He was able to enjoy, endure the experience in the Philippian jail with Silas. Uh, another verse that I really enjoyed there. Um, It's in Acts 16. Um, Well, basically, I think it's 1625. I'll just reference that very quickly. I hope I'm right about the reference. Yes, and about midnight, Paul and Silas, while praying, sang hymns of praise. Who does that? What kind of person in the deepest, darkest Philippian jail... 
after midnight is praying and singing hymns. Someone who's experiencing the unlimited Christ. And then I, there's just a little phrase. You know, there's so many things in the word. And it says there, and the prisoners were listening to them. I don't know if you've noticed. It doesn't say the other prisoners. Paul and Silas were not prisoners in that jail. They were Christ enjoyers. They were transcending their jail by enjoying the transcendent Christ. They weren't prisoners. That's why they could sing, they could praise, they could fellowship, because they were not limited. They were enjoying the unlimited Christ. And, but praise the Lord, the prisoners were listening to them. This is the Christ that Paul enjoyed and that we must enjoy and experience for the one new man. Amen. And then just one other matter, the will of God. What is the will of God for my life? Well, there are two verses which you already read, uh, and I'll reference them. Uh, Colossians 1.9 and Colossians 4.12. They're on our sheet here. Our brother referred to these two verses as the frame of Colossians. There's a lovely, wonderful picture in the book of Colossians. It's a picture of this lovely Christ. But what is the frame that holds the picture? That frame is the will of God. The frame, if maybe you could have a frame that has written around its border, the will of God, 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 the will of God. What's the will of God? The will of God is what's in the frame, what's in the book. It's this marvelous Christ. So, you know, we, we do have, we are always wondering, Lord, what is your will? What is your will for who I will marry? Uh, what is your will concerning my going to the full-time training? Hallelujah. Right, Bastian? Amen. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The will of God. You know, we have a will for our lives, but God's great will, God's heart's desire, God's, God's purpose is for Christ and the church. For Christ to be everything to us. Christ is everything in God's economy. Christ is everything to the Father. This is my beloved Son. With Him I am well pleased. Hear Him. See Him. Be filled with Him. Be constituted with Him. Be saturated with Him so that you can live Him out. That's who I want. That's what I want. I want my Son. As I, and I don't want Him just as one man, but as a corporate expression. The church, His body, the one new man. Christ is the one new man, but as we have the Christ that in us makes us part of the one new man. So the one new man, it says in Colossians, it's again in our reference, we didn't read it, but in Colossians 3, 10 and 11, it says, and put off, verse 9 says, put off the old man. Then 10 says, put on the new man, and then you can, if I just select certain words, where Christ is all and in all. That's the new man. The new man is where Christ is all and in all. And even that phrase, so fine, so detailed, Christ is all and in all. So that means that although we have been crucified with Christ, we have been buried with Christ, we are grafted with Christ. So Paul says in Galatians 2.20, the life which I now live, I live in what? The faith of the Son of God. That means the organic union. So Christ is all, but He is in all. So it is the old man that no longer lives, 
but the new man lives. And we are all part of the new man to the degree that Christ lives in us. So you want, we all pray for, we're all for the one new man. Well then, to bring forth the one new man, we have to be joined with Christ, live with Christ, magnify Christ, experience Him, enjoy Him, and be saturated with Him. Then you are Christ, I am Christ, and corporately we are the one new man. Of course, Christ Himself is the only one with the Godhead, but do we not have His life? Do we not have His nature? And eventually, we have His very person. Let this, back to Philippians, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I need to allow the Lord to renew my mind. So all of the fellowship we have this weekend, I believe we, I hope we would take back to the Lord in prayer. Lord, make this my reality. Lord, work this out in me. Work this out in my spouse. Work this out in my children. Work this out in the brothers. Pray for the brothers. Pray for the elders. Pray for the workers. Pray for the young people. Pray for the trainees. We need so much prayer to bring forth the reality of the one new man. And this is God's great will in, in the Christian life, in the church life, in the universe. God just wants Christ. Christ expressed as the one new man. So with that, how about we come to the outline? I will do my best to finish by 11.45, so we're completely back on schedule, and hopefully 15 minutes for us to, as Brother Mark already said, to complete the message. The message is brought out in the whole body, and not just in our sharing at the end of the message, but then in our fellowship at lunchtime, when we are driving home in our cars, in our prayer, maybe in, well, we'll all be here for the Lord's Day morning meeting, but even in the coming weeks and months, we would just be praying over, reviewing, considering these things, and praying that the Lord would answer our prayer for ourselves and for everybody. Okay, so how about we come to the outline. Uh, the first Roman numeral uh, you could say in a simple way, encapsulates this thought concerning the will of God. So you will see the word God's will, His will, will 11 times in this Roman numeral. What is this matter, this mysterious thing, the mystery of His will, which was hidden in the ages, but in the present time has been brought forth. What a privilege, dear saints that we could know God's big will. So many Christians, what is the will for my life? Or what is the will for our fellowship? Well, there's something greater than our, God's will for our personal lives or even for our individual church life. There is something, God's great will in this universe. And this weekend, we are seeing this great will. Okay, so again... Uh, Roman 1, please. God is a God of purpose. Okay. So I mentioned the frame in Colossians, but I didn't repeat the verses. Colossians 1, 9. Therefore, we also, since the day we heard of it, which is the faith of Colossians, do not cease praying. Here is Paul. This is an example, I would say, of extensiveness, unlimited. Paul didn't just, oh yeah, the Philippians or the Colossians. Yeah, I should mention them in my verse. I do not cease praying and asking on your behalf that you be filled with the full knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Colossians 1.9. Colossians 4.12. Paul had a co-worker, Epaphras. Okay, he had a co-worker. 
His name began with, began with E, who was one of the Colossians. A slave of Christ Jesus greets you. But look, the same, there's this kind of almost parallel construction. Always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. So the beginning of Colossians mentions the great will of God, the end of Colossians, the great will of God. What is this great will? Again, it is the one new man, Christ and the church. And then we see that God had a good pleasure. He wanted something in eternity past, and out of his good pleasure uh, came his will, his determination to uh, accomplish his good pleasure according to his purpose. And that, uh, that, that good pleasure is, we could say, the corporate sonship. In Ephesians 1.5, it says that we were predestinated unto sonship. So God wants not only his only begotten son, who became the firstborn son, but he wants many sons as the church, He wants the many sons as the body of the head. And then that body becomes the one new man, becomes the bride, and that consummates in the new Jerusalem. Amen. So we see in Revelation 4.11, you have created all things, and because of your will, they were and were created. So even God's creation is an expression of His will in the universe. Okay, how about we uh, read through A, B, C, D. We can alternate brothers A, sisters B, and we'll run, read through the points to, and we'll read E together. Okay, A. God's will is God's wish. God's will is what He wants to do. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for making known to us the mystery of your will. Again, dear saints, I I just cannot say how privileged I feel. God, you would unveil your great will, your heart's desire to us. This is a great, great matter. And not many Christians, if you ask them, what is the will of God? Right away, as we've said, they will give you an answer that is related to God's will for their life. But we in the Lord's recovery, I would say, have the distinction is that we uh, know or want God's will for God, not just God's will for us. We want to know, Lord, what is on your heart? What do you want? We want what you want. We will pray for what you want. We will labor for what you want. We will live for what you want, your will that makes you happy. Okay, let's read E together. God works all things according to the counsel of His will. God's will is His intention, and His counsel is His consideration of the way to accomplish His will. Amen. Hallelujah. So then... We come to Roman 2, which tells us that Colossians is a book concerning the great eternal will of God, the highest revelation of Christ. And there's a book that you can go to in the Bible that will unveil God's great eternal will to you. Thank you, Lord. And the reference there are the two frame verses 1, 9 and 4, 12. Okay, how about we read A together? Okay, and then B together. 
Colossians reveals what God's will is according to His desire and intention in the whole universe, in creation, in redemption, in the present age, in the coming age, and in eternity. Wonderful. So all these references underneath, I'll just mention a few. For instance, Ephesians 1.5, predestinating us unto sonship. So this is an aspect of God's great will. He wants not just His firstborn Son who lived and perfectly expressed Him on the earth. He wants that living, reproduced, duplicated in thousands, tens of thousands, millions of His children on the earth. He wants to see Jesus living again in His divinely enriched humanity through the members of His body. So we can see how critical it is for us to go beyond knowing about Christ or knowing about the will of God, but entering into the experience and enjoyment and manifestation, the living out of this one. Okay, and then uh, another verse, Ephesians 3, 9. And to enlighten all that, he, uh, that we may see what the economy of the mystery is. So to carry this out, to accomplish it in... Uh, fallen human beings. How is that possible for God to get His masterpiece? How is it possible for the sons of the devil to become the sons of God? Well, God has an economy and an arrangement involving His sons, firstborn sons, incarnation, perfect human living, all-inclusive death, destroying all the negative things. His transcending resurrection, His ascension and His enthronement, and then His dispensing all of that reality into us. And I know we hear these things and we know these things, but again, how much are we practicing? Right? We hear the term, ordinary days under the divine dispensing. Well, you know, the conference is a special time, but... It really, what really, really counts are the ordinary days. Won't be Saturday and Sunday, although that's a great, you know, we see a vision and we see something. But then we need to go home and then every day, ordinary days, looking after the children. Ordinary days, commuting to work. Ordinary days, meeting with the brothers. But are we enjoying every morning the dispensing? the dispensing of this one into each one of us. Then uh, that was the economy in 3.9. 3.10 mentions the church. In order that now to the rulers and authorities in the heavenlies, the multifarious wisdom of God might be made known through the church. So the church is a great matter in the, in the great will of God. So we need to be the church in reality. We've seen it. It's not just an outward belonging. It is a living. It is the church life. It's an experience. The experiences of Christ are the what are issue in the genuine church life. The Lord says in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. It is not the church of any pastor, any domine. It is not the church of any co-worker. The co-workers are slaves serving the Lord. It's only one person's church, his church. I will build my church. So a great prayer, Lord, build your church and build it in me and build it through me and build it through my family and build it through the the brothers and sisters and my local church, build the church. Then Revelation 19 refers to the, uh, the lamb, the wife of the lamb. And then Revelation 11 mentions the kingdom of God also. The church life today is the the reality of the kingdom of the heavens on the earth. But do we live? Do I live under the throne? Am I ruled by the heavens to have the reality of the kingdom in my personal life and corporately in our church life? And then consummating in Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem. So many of these points... uh, 
are at least uh, implied in the book of Colossians revealing what God's great will is. Okay, C. We need to be filled with the full knowledge of God's will. That was Paul's prayer in one nine. That you may be filled with the full knowledge of His will. Amen. And then uh, one under that, let's read it. God's will in Colossians 1, nine. Amen. Two says to have the full knowledge of God's will is to have the revelation of God's plan so that we may know what God plans to do in the universe. And I just, you know, anytime I see the word revelation, I hope our realization is how important or how vital it is that we pray. Right? This is something that is a prerequisite to receive revelation. I just appreciate uh, the Lord's word to Peter when he asked his disciples in Caesarea Philippi, who do men say that I am? And then, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then the Lord said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. This has not been revealed to you by men, but by my Father in the heavens. So I don't presume, because I've read the message, I've studied the message, i prepared for the message, that I clearly see. Lord, unveil me. So I, I can assure you, over the last few days, just pray, Lord, show me. Unveil the reality of the one new man to me. I want to see it. And when we see it, then we can experience it. If you can't see it, if it's hidden from you, you can't know it. Therefore, you can't experience it. You can't live it. So we must have, we need revelation that the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ would grant to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation the eyes of our heart having been enlightened. So again, and this is not revelation merely in our head, but in our heart, in our spirit. And that kind of revelation becomes a vision that governs us, controls us, revolutionizes us, keeps us, preserves us all our days. You know, uh, I teach in the training in London, and of course I come here to Pretoria. Also, I serve in the training in London. But I tell the trainees again and again and again, just because you have gone through the training is not a guarantee that you will be preserved in the central line or in the church life all your days. That requires revelation, that requires exercise, that requires so many things, faithfulness. But we, at least we need a governing vision. We need revelation. So we should all pray for that. And then we should pray, Lord, keep me. Keep me all my days in the central lane of your economy. And I'll say this way this morning, Lord, Keep me in the center of your will all my days. The center of your will. Well, Christ's will, God's will is Christ and the church. So when you say, keep me in the center of your will, you're praying to be kept in the enjoyment of Christ and in the center of the church life and on the line of the genuine New Testament ministry that opens these things to us. This is not a small thing. Not to be sidetracked, not to be distracted with kind of peculiar teachings. Myths and gene genealogies is what Paul refers to in 1 Timothy 1.4. He said, I charge Timothy to remain in Ephesus and not to teach different things, but God's economy, which is in faith. That's the central lane. May the Lord preserve us all in the central lane of His will and His economy all our days. But we need to pray. Okay, 
So let's read A together. God's plan is to make Christ everything in the divine economy. So I have to ask myself the question, Lord, are you everything in my life? Because God's will is to make Christ everything. Christ is everything to the Father. Everything. If that's the Father's heart's desire and good pleasure, why would it not be our heart's desire and good pleasure? Father, make the desire of your heart the desire of my heart. Lord, I don't want to desire anything apart from your desire. I want what you want. So, Lord, give me the best husband, the best wife that will keep me or bring me more and more into your perfect will and your heart's desire. These are the things we should pray for. Lord, where should we live? What is the best according to your will for your economy? Everything is framed in the big will of God. All the small things, everything eventually would be, we would fellowship, transact with the Lord about this. We want to buy something, something new. We all enjoy buying things. Lord, is this your will? Do I really need another pair of shoes? Do I need a new car every two years? Or whatever it is. The Lord wants to be everything to us. Do I need another degree before I go to the training? Do I need a master's before I go to the training? We should ask the Lord and we should fellowship. What is your perfect will, your great will? Okay, and then uh, let's read B. The revelation of God's plan opens the way for us to have more experience of Christ. The revelation opens the way for us to have more experience. That's why we need revelation. That's why we need to pray for revelation. And may the Lord save some of us, particularly from our strong, clever mind. Knowing is not the same as revelation. Knowledge is not necessarily revelation. You can know all of these teachings and go off the side of a cliff. Because it's in your brain, it's in your mind, and then you think about these things. And that's subject to thoughts, even satanic thoughts being injected, because you're using mainly your mind, not your spirit. These things are revealed spiritually. So we must engage our spirit, we must engage in prayer to truly see these things. Okay, three together to know and experience the all-inclusive, extensive Christ requires all spiritual wisdom and understanding. If we could read A and B under those points, that's, this is from a footnote that explains this. Go ahead. Spiritual wisdom and understanding are of the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Okay, and then uh, the remaining two points related to God's will. Walking worthily of the Lord. This is Colossians 1.10, to walk worthily of the Lord, to please Him in all things. Walking worthily of the Lord issues from the full knowledge of God's will. Such a walk is uh, one in which we live Christ. So again, we could summarize it in a very simple way. What is God's will? God's will is is that I live Christ. That's it. You just live Christ. You wake up, you enjoy Christ. You go to have breakfast, you enjoy Christ as the reality of your breakfast. You've just had your breakfast before you've had your breakfast. Your clothing is Christ. Your marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. 
your working, even your secular work, is a picture we need to work for the Lord in all that we do. Everything is Christ. We just live Christ in our daily life using words if necessary. Amen. Okay, E together. We need to stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. So that is the goal at the end of Colossians. You stand mature, full-grown man, that we all arrive at the oneness of the faith and the measure, the fullness of Christ, at the measure of the uh, person of Christ. That's uh, the revelation of the one new man in Ephesians chapter 4. Until we all arrive at a full grown man. And in Colossians, we all arrive at standing mature in all the will of God. Okay, Roman 3 together. The will of God for us is that we know the all-inclusive, extensive Christ, experience Him, and live Him as our life. Maybe we could, I'm not saying we do it now, but that will be a wonderful point to pray over. Or frame, if you're a framer, a print out and put it on a frame. This is a marvelous, frameable quote. Put it beside your front door for all your guests. The will of God for us is that we know the all-inclusive, extensive Christ, experience Him and live Him as our life. I don't think I did a particularly good job on extensive, but this means unlimited to the... uh, unlimited degree. Again, our love is so finite, so limited, so small, so narrow, yet the love of God loved the whole world, loves all men. Our forgiveness, yes, I forgive you once, I don't forgive you a second time, or I do forgive you a second time, and then the third time, I remind you how many times you've offended me. But God, and I thank Him for this, Not only does he forgive, he forgets. So you're going, Lord, here I am again confessing the same sin. And he's going, what what sin? Because he forgives and forgets. So this is something of extensiveness, unlimitedness. Okay, so we know the all-inclusive extents of Christ. Okay, A, the will of God is in Christ, concentrated in Christ, and for Christ. If Christ is everything in the will of God. So again, is that our experience? Lord, are you everything? Maybe we could spend some time to lay out our life and our living before the Lord. Yes, Lord, in this, in this matter, you have the first place. But I have to confess to you, in that matter... In this matter, regarding this person, you don't have the first place. You don't have the preeminence. You're not even involved in this. But Lord, I don't agree with that. Lord, I open this matter, this person, this area, this desire, this consideration to you. Lord, be everything to me. Okay, can we read the points underneath? One. The extents of Christ is the Christ who's more vast than the universe and who is everything to us. And this Christ is so vast that no one person can experience all of this Christ. So again, here is another reason why we really need the church life. And Ephesians uh, 3.18, it says that we may be full of strength to apprehend with all the saints. And then here is uh, a a unveiling of the extents of Christ, the unlimited Christ, what the breadth and the length and the height and depth are. There's no definition. What is the breadth? What is the length? What is the height? What is the depth? That's Christ. And one of my favorite hymns I was just considering, again, someone who experiences hymn 595. Emmy Barber, she uh, said in stanza three of that hymn, there is always something over when we share in all his love. Then it says, unplumbed depths still lie beneath us. Unscaled heights rise far above. 
Human lips can never utter all his wondrous tenderness. We can only praise and wonder and his name forever bless. This was a dear sister in an extremely limited situation in China. The hymn written after she'd given away her last dollar. But that wasn't her last dollar because outwardly she was poor, but inwardly rich in Christ. So she could then pen, there is always something over. And the unscaled heights, the unplumbed depths, this dear one knew the unlimited Christ. Okay, two. Christ the Savior and Lord in whom we believe is limitless and inexhaustible since He is without limitation, the revelation concerning Him must also be without limitation. Okay. C says the Christ unveiled in Colossians is the all-inclusive, extensive, preeminent one, the centrality and universality, the center and circumference of God's economy. This is Christ in God's economy. This is Christ's, uh, God's estimation of Christ. He is the center. He is the circumference. He is uh, the centrality, the universality. If that is what Christ is to God, how much more should he be this to us? So again, another wonderful point to pray over. Lord, be my centrality. Be my hub. It talks about in Colossians uh, 1.17, all things cohere in him. All things are held together by this Christ. The universe is held together by this Christ. How about my universe? How about my family? Our brother mentioned in the message, but can honestly testify, the same, Lord, you must be the holding center of my family life, the holding center of my married life. There's no way we can stay together apart from Christ. But He is the co inhering one and the one that holds all things together. So in our married life, our family life, may we experience more and more this Christ. Okay, how about the points underneath C? We could alternate brothers, then sisters. One, two, three, four. The reality of every positive thing, Colossians 2, 16 and 17, no one judge you in eating, drinking, these uh, um, eating and drinking um, in respect of a feast or a new moon of the Sabbath. If you read the footnote, you see this is the enjoyment of Christ daily, weekly, monthly and yearly. Uh, he is the reality of those shadows. The body is of Christ. OK, two sisters. God wants Christ and Christ alone. How about me? How about you? Do we have other things that we want? We all have other things that we want. Again, Lord, yes, I want this thing or I want that thing. But Lord, I'd like to tell you, I want you more. And if not getting that thing means I get more of you, then I choose you. Lots of little practical prayers. This is uh, my son, the beloved, in whom I have Found my delight, hear him. Okay, dear brothers, three. God's dispensing is altogether related to Christ and focused on him, that Christ may make his home in your heart, my heart. Lord, my heart is so sticky, my heart is full of so many other things. Lord, make home in all the areas, every room of my heart. These are, you know, we have prayed these prayers, but these prayers make a great difference. God is waiting for us to sincerely pray this kind of prayer to him. Okay, four, sisters, God's will... Extensive 
Christ into our being as our life and everything that we may become. This is God's will, the corporate expression of the triune God. But there can be no corporate expression without individual enjoyment. If I don't enjoy Christ, if Bevan doesn't enjoy Christ, if William doesn't enjoy Christ, then we come together as the brothers. What expression? As was described by an eldership that I belonged to many years ago, one brother said, you know what? He said, you four brothers are like four ball bearings in a jar. Four steel hard ball bearings in a jar. Shake, 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 shake. There's still four steel unblended, unmingled, unjoined ball bearings. But when we enjoy Christ, William enjoys Christ, Bevan enjoys Christ, I enjoy Christ, when we come together, wow, then we have the real expression, enjoyment, and joy, and manifestation of Christ. That's one kind of meeting. But in all our meetings, on Lord's Day, The roof should be coming down with our enjoyment and experience at our table meetings. It should just be almost a competition. Who can get in with a prayer or a praise or a thanksgiving? Because we're just all enjoying the rich Christ individually and then corporately. The corporate expression of the triune God. And then people will just fall down in our midst and go, God is among you. Okay, uh, is it okay? Let's read D together. The will of God is that the all inclusive, extensive Christ be our portion, our life, our constituent, and our, and our peace. For the one new man, we must allow the peace of Christ and Christ as our peace to arbitrate in our hearts. This is a wonderful handle in Colossians, on how to arrive at the reality of the one new man. We have to let the peace of Christ dwell in us. We also need to uh, allow the word of Christ to dwell in us. Okay, so one says in uh, one nine, God's will refers to Christ. The will of God is profound in relation to knowing, experiencing, and living in the all-inclusive, extensive Christ. Three, or two together, please. Okay, uh, three, God's will. Okay, I'll just mention this uh, here. You know, it says in Colossians 2, 6, as therefore you have received the Christ Jesus, the Lord, walk in him. And then verse 7 says, having been rooted and being built up in him. And so just... A little experience recently, uh, you know, this matter again, my driving, my driving, Lord, I want you to drive, you drive. But you know what? He gets to turn on the ignition, and that's about as far as he's allowed. Then I take over. So, you know, I was, had this two-hour road trip to take one weekend, and I was absolutely determined. And of course, my wife is my co-pilot, navigator, and corrector and adjuster of every maneuver I make. Um, but I was determined, I'm going to allow the Lord to drive, I'm going to allow the Lord to drive. And yet again, another fail, another failure. And I was just like, Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand. I'm praying about this. I'm opening about this. Uh, Why can't I, this, why is this not happening? It says here, walk in him. But then I realized there is something in verse 7 right away. Having been rooted... The walking follows being rooted. So if we want to do anything in our Christian life that expresses, lives Christ, we first have to be rooted in Christ as our good land. So I need to spend time in the morning putting my roots down into this Christ. As my roots go down, I absorb the riches. I absorb the elements that are in the soil. 
Christ is the best driver. That is in the soil. So you need to be in the soil, rooted, and then you can walk. Then you can drive in Him in reality. So I'm just discovering this more and more. We say we should have morning revival, but what for? Why? Receive the dispensing, but also to be rooted in this one who is our genuine land. South Africa apparently is a good land, but there's a better good land. And I'm not talking about Israel. I'm talking about the good land of Christ. He's our allotted portion, also revealed in Colossians. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you for a share of the allotted portion. You have been given your unique portion of Christ. So may we be rooted in Him so we can walk in Him. Okay, so then E together. We should estimate and evaluate everything according to the all-inclusive, extensive Christ. I would just say this is something very, very critical. Do not estimate and evaluate the brothers and sisters, uh, the world situation, apart from Christ. There is a mind out there a mind in the system, the media of the world, the internet, the thought. You, I, I hope we realize there is a mind, a satanic thought behind almost everything in the world. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I just, we do not spend enough time setting our mind on the things which are above. We do not spend enough time in the Word of God, allowing our mind to be renewed with Christ. But if we did, then we would estimate, we would evaluate everything according to this one. For the one new man, it says we need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. I realized, I told the Lord, I was jogging one day recently, I said, Lord, my mind is a rubbish pit. My mind is a dump of all kinds of rubbish from the world, from reading media, this and that, taking in all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of opinions. Lord, sanctify me. Renew my mind. We need, dear saints, to be in the Word uh, so that we would have a renewed mind and then estimate everything according to Christ. Okay, for time, let us just read F. We need to be infused, saturated, and permeated with the all-inclusive extents of Christ until in our experience He is everything to us. Amen. And because of time, how about we just come to B? I'll leave the last remaining points so we can have some time for overflow. Um, If we could go to that point. But I'll read two First, myself, it says we should allow the all-inclusive extents of Christ to fill our whole being and to replace our culture with Himself. There is a South African culture. Within South Africa, there's an African culture. There's an Afrikaans culture. There's an English culture. All of that is dung, forgive me, in comparison to Christ. We cannot evaluate things according to our Afrikaans or South African or African culture. We must evaluate everything by Christ and allow Him to replace. How else can there be the one new man? There is not a South African one new man or a British one new man or a Chinese one new man or an American one new man. There is only one new man. And he's not South African. He's not British, not American, not as... He is actually, he's kind of Israeli. He's Christ. And that's why Mark can come 10,000 miles and sit down and pray with a brother from South Africa for an hour without effort. No problem at all. No, no difference, no barriers, no how's it, no anything. How's it going? What's up? Americans say, what's up? Amer- uh, South Africans say, how's it? Don't have to say to that, just... Let's enjoy Christ together. Okay, so we'll conclude with B, and I will stop, and hopefully we'll have some overflow from you all. Okay, B. 
The all-inclusive, extensive Christ desires to replace every element of our natural life and culture with Himself so that we may be the one new man as His corporate expression. This is the message of the book of Colossians. Amen. Thank you, brothers.